About 200 paces from a densely wooded western bank of the Hudson River, midway between New York City and Albany, and half hidden under 300 years of undisturbed undergrowth, rests the skeletal remains of an old sawmill. It was recently discovered by James Burkheis, a retired law librarian, while researching the evolution of turnpikes and water transport in the area. He had previously found a document that mentioned the location of a sawmill owned by a man called Gomez, and he went looking for it, only to discover he had stumbled upon something of even broader historic value. The remains of the sawmill turned out to be the last vestiges of an important industrial venture, spearheaded by one of colonial America's earliest and most successful Jewish industrialists and merchant pioneers, Luis Moses Gomez. Gomez had been among the first European settlers to recognize the commercial potential of Hudson Valley's natural resources, particularly its timber and limestone. Both were ideal construction materials for nearby New York City, which had been expanding rapidly. Gomez had arrived from Jamaica with his wife and four sons just a few years earlier, around 1700. And he was eager to advance trade with the Caribbean islands where he had been living, the greatest center of New World commerce of his day. The bustling port of New York City at the mouth of the Hudson River together with its natural resources upstream, was perfect, he had determined, for his expansive dreams. But first, he needed an auxiliary base upstate. So early on, he built a simple one-room stone structure not far from the sawmill to provide a headquarters for these upstate operations. In time, that simple building would become the Gomez Millhouse Museum. Today, it is recognized as the oldest Jewish dwelling still standing in North America. Who was Gomez, and what brought him to New York in the first place? There are no remaining images of him, but through those of his son Daniel and great-grandson Benjamin, echoes of his stately bearing and fortitude are evident. A man of wealth and stature, Family lore suggests that his father, Isaac Gomez, had been a close advisor to Philip IV, King of Spain. A generation or two earlier, the Gomez family had been converted under pressure to Catholicism during the mass conversion of Jews in Spain and Portugal at the end of the 15th century. These converted Jews, known as conversos, or maranos, faced the wrath of an inquisition designed to arrest and torture any convert suspected of continuing to practice Jewish rites in secret. And even though it most probably included Isaac, King Philip was eager to keep him safe. So the two had agreed that if and when word reached the royal court that inquisition officials were about to arrest Isaac, whether or not he was guilty, the king would rush off a quick message to him saying that the onions are beginning to smell. This would allow Isaac time to flee. We know he escaped because in time, his effigy, not his body, would be burned at the stake. Afraid that he might indeed be arrested, Isaac had already sent away his wife, two daughters, and his infant son, Luis. They had traveled over the Pyrenees Mountains to Bayonne in southwestern France. Here there was no inquisition, and Bayonne was where other family members and a large colony of conversos like themselves had created a flourishing community. It was now in the middle of the 17th century. Isaac's son, Luis Moses Gomez, was growing up in a town that had blossomed into a major port for New World trade. On top of that, young Luis would have been raised in the privileged circumstances befitting the son of someone who had so recently served the King of Spain. Typically, he would have received a good education, 
probably from tutors, but also from classes in a town where the Converso community ran its own schools. The French needed these Conversos to rebuild an economy that had fallen onto hard times, and there was an air of tolerance, freedom, and opportunity that would have allowed Luis to gain a strong self-identity and confidence. Typically, these young men would first be sent to a transitional center of Jewish transatlantic trade, such as London or Amsterdam. Such trade dominated the affairs of those around him. We believe Gomez went to London for training around 1680, when he was in his early 20s. A few years later, he moved onto the Caribbean island of Jamaica, which already had one of the largest trading communities in the New World. Many conversos who had settled in Jamaica had already returned to Judaism. The British had captured the island from the Spanish in 1655, and they had permitted Jews to settle and practice their faith if they so desired. Our Gomez did. But trade opportunities in Jamaica did not last long. In 1692, there was a catastrophic earthquake in Port Royal, its primary commercial city. This was followed by repeated fires. There was talk of God having abandoned them. By contrast, hundreds of miles to the north, the Atlantic port of New York had begun to grow rapidly. It offered a more stable environment. And what was just as important to a man like Gomez, who had recently started a family, there had been openly practicing Jews in New York since 1654. Gomez made his move. He was now an established, respected merchant with years of experience in commerce and international trade. He had a vast network of trusted contacts and he would arrive in New York speaking perfect French from his childhood in Bayonne and impeccable English from his time in London and Jamaica. Both would have immediately eased his entry into the top New York families of the day. He had a wife, Esther, whom he had married while in Jamaica, and they had four sons, Jacob, Mordecai, Daniel, and David. He wasted no time. By 1705, only a handful of years after his arrival in New York, he was already petitioning for an act of denization from Queen Anne of England to expand his merchant privileges. This was needed because the North American colonies had not yet won their independence from England, and he was foreign-born. It was granted. Anne, by the grace of God, Queen of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, to all to whom these presents shall come. We have granted, and by these presents in our own name, and for our heirs and successors, hereby do grant to Luis Gomez a man, chosen by us, who, although born across the sea, is hereby made our faithful subject, and will ever be our licensed denizen. This denization granted Gomez a wide range of rights, including the right to purchase land and other holdings. And he and his heirs may hold, possess, use, and enjoy all property and acquisitions of whatever kind or nature in whatever places and jurisdictions within our Kingdom of England. Given at Westminster, the 18th day of April, in the fourth year of our reign, April 18, 1705. He had been constantly hearing about emerging commercial opportunities from others in the New York mercantile community. Among these was 4,000 acres of undeveloped land one mile west of the Hudson River in what is today the town of Newburgh. It encompassed limestone cliffs and vast stretches of densely forested areas. These were exactly the raw materials that were in strong demand in the surrounding settlements and in the expanding city. Unlike many of the others who bought and held large land parcels at that time simply for future appreciation, Gomez saw the immediate business potential. 
For in the interim years, he had grown into the sort of risk-taking entrepreneur with boundless energy and drive, who had a keen eye for developing opportunities that others would miss. The timing was also right. Three of his sons were now old enough to be deployed to look after this part of his growing initiatives. And bringing his sons into the business as soon as they were old enough was how these conversos had typically built their widespread business enterprises. So, about a mile from the river, he arranged for the construction of a stone dwelling to use as a base for this Hudson Valley venture. Carved into a hillside, it started out with only one large room, which incorporated an outsized fireplace for cooking and heat and a storage area burrowed deep into the hill at the back. In time, the house would be expanded to include more private living and sleeping quarters in a second room and additional storage space. Eventually, future owners would expand it further. Gomez is important to remember not only for his upstate enterprises. He also became a key figure in the development of New York City itself. Gomez and his son, Mordecai, had already acquired underwater rights along Hunter's Key, located near present-day South Street Seaport on the East River. These included extended rights to trade along the Hudson River from New York City to Kingston, north of the Mill House. On top of that, their vast operations now included a monopoly on all wheat exports to England, additional land holdings in the city, distilleries, shipping, and the right to import goods for sale such as tea, spices, oils, wine. But Gomez was far more than simply a businessman eager to feather his family's nest. Like many of these former conversos, he had clearly internalized the need to help safeguard the future for Jews after the traumas of expulsion and Inquisition nightmares. Doing so must have seemed especially critical in a new world dedicated to religious tolerance. His ancestors had been leaders of the Jewish community back in Spain and Bayonne. In his own lifetime, due to the impact of those mass conversions and later persecutions by the Inquisition, he had also seen Jews almost wiped off the map of Europe. Those in Eastern Europe were not yet numerous. Clearly, he felt a personal obligation to do whatever he could to place the emerging New York Jewish community, at the very least, on a more solid footing. He began by taking a leadership role in Congregation Sheriff Israel, the earliest formal congregation in North America. It had been founded soon after the first 23 Jews set foot in the city some 70 years earlier. But it had never had its own building. Instead, members were still meeting in each other's homes or rented rooms. Gomez offered to lead a fundraising effort to enable the construction of its own synagogue. He and his family were also willing to donate a parcel of land they owned on Mill Street, in the heart of the commercial and residential community that comprised New York City at this time. Today, the interior is preserved inside the neoclassic synagogue on Central Park West at 70th Street, where Congregation Sheriff Israel now meets. Gomez also believed in building strong relationships with the non-Jewish civic leaders who had become his friends, neighbors, and colleagues. As a result, he spearheaded a campaign among his congregants to donate funds to help rebuild the spire of the nearby Trinity Church that had been destroyed by fire. Gomez died in 1740 at the age of 86, but his vision did not end even at his death. His concern about the future of Jewish worship and the Jewish world would be reflected in the activities of his sons and succeeding generations of the family. 
In time, they too would become deeply involved in the maintenance and operation of Sheriff Israel. They are mentioned frequently in the minute books of the congregation. They even had a motto. Boundless as the fishes of the sea was honor and integrity of the Gomez family. Supported by lion's strength, they did their faith uphold, nor would they change it for a crown of gold. However, while the Jewish community was developing in the city itself, Gomez's original investment in the Hudson River Valley and the ongoing labors of his sons did not lead to the immediate settlement of Jewish families in that area. This happened later. Nevertheless, his role and that of other Jews in early New York represent the pioneering ventures that these merchants brought to the founding and development of New York City, to the industry and settlement of the Hudson River Valley, and of the entrepreneurial innovation that is the hallmark of American life today.